Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out on an incredibly gorgeous day. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to take advantage of that uh, earlier. Appreciate you coming out for the sixth and final talk in the geology lecture series this year. And right off the bat, uh, because usually I forget, thanks to the guys in the tech booth who make sure that this gets broadcast and also uh, now recorded as well so that uh, the talks are archived on the web. Also to the college for providing this fantastic space for us to utilize. And also to Oregon Resources Corporation for financial support of this event as well. If you didn't sign your name to one of these handy dandy little sheets, if you could take two seconds when you leave tonight to go ahead and do that, it helps justify when you're asking folks for money, being able to tell them how many folks show up. And I've been pleased we've averaged about 200 people per talk this year, which is fantastic around here. Uh, you won't be able to see any posters for a while, but if you track next year, you can go to www.socc.edu, find the geology department or Metzger, and when I start getting things scheduled, you'll be able to track that down. If you have an electronic device, if you would not mind turning it off at present, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening Julianne Struva, who got her PhD at the University of Colorado in geography, but probably as much as any geographer that I've known, she has sort of the geology gene of outdoors and doing uh, those type of geological things. And doing a mix of both computer modeling and using that mathematics side, as well as going out and doing field work, which I think makes for a, a very interesting combination of, of things. Uh, and works at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Raise your hand if you had ever heard of that before. Okay, great. We've got two, maybe three, three and a half. So I, truthfully, I've heard of NCAR a lot, but NSIDC I had not heard about so much. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening from uh, Colorado, Dr. Julianne Struva. Thank you, Ron. Um, yeah, it's surprising that not many people have heard of uh, NSIDC, is what we call it, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. We are a NASA-funded data archive center, so if there's any data that you want related to snow and ice, we are the place to come and get it. So we have a whole huge collection of um, snow and ice data, and it can be from satellite data, it can be from people going into the field, and it can be ice cores from people drilling, so, um, and, every, and almost all the data I would say 99% of our data is free, so um, it's a great resource, and we also have a lot of educational resources as well for people who want to learn more about the cryosphere. So tonight I'm going to talk about um, the Arctic on the fast track of change, and in my research I primarily work with satellite data, so I'm pretty much talking about changes that have been happening over the last 30 to 40 years, because that is the data that I'm working with. So it's not very long term in terms of its geological record, and I'm, I'm not actually a geologist, I came from aerospace engineering and I focused more on um, the satellite aspect of it and then did my PhD in geography studying Greenland. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is just some of the changes happening in the Arctic and I'll focus a bit on the work that I do a lot which is looking at the sea ice cover. So just to get started, um, you know, for, for quite a few decades scientists have been predicting that if the planet was going to be warming, if it was going to be changing, that we should start seeing some of the signs of this change in the Arctic first. And part of the reason why is because the Arctic is a place that's covered by snow and ice almost year round. And as you know, snow and ice is, is kind, of, kind of bright and it reflects most of the sun's energy back out to space. So if there is some sort of warming signal happening, you might start losing some of that snow and ice cover, which allows the darker surfaces such as the land to be exposed to the ocean that can absorb more of the sun's energy and lead to further warming. So when we look at climate model projections of what the warming is going to be in the future, and this is just a map of the Earth looking at the end of the century, if, if we just do business as usual, so we keep increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, just going along as we ha are, um, the global mean warming that they predict in these models is about two and a half, three degrees Celsius over the entire planet, with the land areas warming about by three and a half percent. But when you look, or three and a half degrees, but when you look at the Arctic, these regions up here in the purple, you're seeing this region warming by at least seven degrees Celsius um, by 2100. And when we look at the current temperature changes that we're seeing, 
And this is looking at the GIST temperature anomaly record. So here we're starting in 1880 and going through till 2010, or actually 2011. And we look at the spatial pattern of where this warming's been happening. The one thing you do notice is that the Arctic is, is a lot redder than the rest of the planet. The warming is definitely amplified in the Arctic region. You can also tell that nine out of the, the ten, nine out of the warmest years since 1880 have occurred since 2000. So we've definitely been experiencing a decade of, of much warmer temperatures than we have seen in the last hundred some years. And again, we, we see that the land areas are experiencing the majority of the warming, but it's certainly focused in the Arctic. Now, how do we, how do we monitor changes in the Arctic? I mean, it's certainly not an easy place to get to, and humans have been in the Arctic for a long time. There's a lot of people living in the Arctic as well for centuries. And so a lot of our knowledge has come from some of the earlier exploration studies, ships that went through the Arctic, the people living in the Arctic. But it's not really easy to get there. It's pretty miserable, large times of the year. It's very cold. And so we need to find other ways to map what's going on in these remote, sort of inhospitable regions. And so one way we do that is we work with satellites. And this is just a snapshot of some of the satellites that NASA currently has in orbit. Um, there's dozens of satellites from NASA and of course, we also have the DOD has satellites, NOAA has satellites, the Europeans, the Japanese, um, the Russians. So there's a lot of satellites up in space. But what this allows us to do is, is map the entire planet. And we usually get several looks per day of a certain region. And so um, we can monitor changes consistently every day over a long time period, which allows us to better understand climate changes that are happening. So what do we see happening? Well, one of the things that we see happening in the Arctic is that there's been more melting happening on the Greenland ice sheet. And this is just an image, for example, of 2007, just melting day anomalies in Greenland. And typically, the Greenland ice sheet will show melting mostly here in the southern part of the ice sheet, um, and mostly along the coastal regions. And what we've been starting to see, you can kind of see some of these yellow areas where some of these higher elevation or higher latitude regions are starting to show some melting as well. This line is sort of the equilibrium line altitude where typically you don't see any melt above that. But we've been starting to see melt um, reaching some of these higher elevation regions in recent years. And if we just look at a time series of just the spatial area of Greenland that's been experiencing melt, since basically since 1979 when we've started having a pretty continuous record of satellite observations that can monitor things like changes in the melt extent of Greenland. And we'll see that the melt has been increasing over time um, during this time period. And what makes that significant for some place like Greenland is Greenland contains enough ice that if it were all to melt, it would raise global sea level by about 7 meters or 24 feet. So there's quite a bit of ice here. The ice that's at the summit of the ice sheet is about 3,000 meters thick. So um, there's a lot of ice. And one way we've been monitoring more of these recent changes just in the mass balance of Greenland, because that's what our concern is in terms of sea level, is that NASA launched a satellite mission called GRACE, which is a gravity instrument, which is measuring basically the, gravity, the gravitational pull with the Earth. And so by looking at changes in the gravity, you can kind of get an idea of how this mass is changing. And so basically, these areas in green and then the blues and the purples are showing just where the mass is lost every summer, for example, over Greenland. And you do have areas in the higher elevations that are actually showing increases, so more precipitation happening. But if you look at the cumulative change in the mass balance, Greenland has been losing mass, at least since 2003 when this um, satellite instrument was lost. And so in terms of when you're thinking about sea level, this is the place in the Arctic where you're going to start really thinking, well, you know, what is Greenland going to do? Because this is the, where we're starting to lose mass, and this is where we can really contribute to changes in sea level. One thing that, um, so every summer when, when Greenland does experience melt, you get these surface features, these lakes that form on the ice sheet. And one of the things that scientists have been looking at is, well, where does the melt water go? Because Greenland is going to lose mass by either melting the ice on the surface, or it's going to lose mass by discharging more glaciers from the ice sheet, so the icebergs that come off. So we really want to better understand where does this go, because what we've been thinking is that if Greenland's melting more, some of that meltwater could percolate down to the bedrock and help speed up some of the glacial discharge rates. And so here's a movie that um, a colleague of mine made when he was in Greenland um, last summer. And there should be sound to this, but 
A team of scientists from US and UK records and witnesses the birth and death of a superglacial lake named Lake Ponting. The lake filled in five days, reaching depths of about six meters and an extent of about 1.5 kilometers. Yeah, there's still there should be, and it was flowing out. Time-lapse cameras and sensors in the lake recorded the fast and violent drainage that occurred in about one hour. I think we should go grab the sensors, the transducers. But if you grab it, I can, uh, unless you exchange it. The lake drained through the bottom of a monster moulin, about 10 meters in diameter. After the drainage, the water was roaring into the Mulan in all its fury and power. An aerial view from a remotely controlled helicopter shows the large ice and snow blocks that were lifted during the drainage. Each of these blocks can weigh as much as three fire trucks. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. These lake drainage events, um, the one thing that we're curious about, again, is if, if you have such a massive drainage and it happens so quickly over time, that you can actually get some uplift of the ice below it. And that could actually, you know, in one hand help, you know, speed up some of the discharge rates of some of the outlet glaciers. We're also finding that in some of these cases, some of these lake drainages are actually keeping the water at a different level, like these, these rivers that they're finding now underneath the ice sheet that are actually staying liquid water. And we recently found one on the eastern edge of the ice sheet where some folks were drilling ice cores. They were trying to get closer to the coast and, and do some different coring, and they kept hitting water, which they weren't ready to prepare to drill with. So it was actually ruining their, their drilling program. But, so we're, we're really trying to better understand what's happening to some of this water, because if the water's staying on the ice sheet and it's not going into the ocean, then it's not going to affect sea level at all. Well, one of the um, biggest outlet glaciers on Greenland is the Jakobshavn Glacier. And it discharges at about seven kilometers per year of icebergs into the, to the fjord and into the ocean. But what this shows is that it's showing the difference. I think my, my um, laser's dead, but basically, oh, there we go. There's, so there's a grounding line in 1851, and just how this grounding line of this glacier has receded to where it is right now in 2010. This glacier is showing dramatic changes in terms of its um, grounding line location and how much ice is actually coming out of here now in, into the the ocean. Oops. Oh, well, that's okay. Oh, sorry, I just, I keep looking at the wrong screen here. But basically, we saw that the ice front has re receded by more than 40 kilometers between 1851 and 2010. It's a huge change on this outlet glacier. Another sign, of course, of um, warming or changes that are happening in the Arctic is in terms of the changes that are happening to the glaciers there. And like most glaciers around the world right now, a lot of the glaciers in the Arctic are also receding. And so here's just an example of the McCall Glacier in 1958. And here it is again in 2003. There's some changes. It's not quite as dramatic as some others, such as the Muir Glacier, which is in 1941, and then the Muir Glacier in 2004. And it's, it's shrunk quite a bit and um, is continually experiencing a negative mass balance. And if we look at, for example, the mass balance of some Arctic glaciers, over the last, basically since about 1960, we do notice that there was a period when they tended to actually be in a period of increase, but basically since about 1990, all those glaciers have been receding, and so they're actually in a period of negative mass loss. Um, and basically, I mean, if, you, if you're melting more of your glaciers in your places like Greenland, that's where your sea level rises can come from, is through melting of the glaciers and the land ice. Another sign of a warmer Arctic is that permafrost is deg degrading in the Arctic. And this shows a map of where the permafrost areas are. So the, the dark purple, purple is a permanently frozen ground, which occupies you know, a lot of Siberia and Alaska and Canada. Um, then you also have the, the lighter purple, which is like the intermittently frozen ground. And basically, um, permafrost occupies about 24% of the northern hemisphere. And the concern with the permafrost is that there's a lot of carbon stored in the permafrost. So if we start warming the temperatures of the land in the Arctic and start allowing the critters that have been frozen in the, in the permafrost to start becoming active and emitting more methane, 
that that would be another feedback that would happen with the warming that we're seeing. And so we can look at, um, oops, oh, my image went away. There was a figure here that was kind of nice. I don't know what happened to it. That's too bad. Well, anyways, um, so in Alaska right now, we're seeing about a four to six degrees Celsius increase in permafrost temperatures in the last um, hundred some years, and it's been accelerating in the last 30 years. Siberia is also showing um, warming in its permafrost, about three degrees Celsius. The Canadian Arctic is a little bit less of a warming rate. And even the Tibetan Plateau, we've been seeing um, changes since the 1970s, where the ground is also warming. And this just shows some pictures of some of the infrastructure impacts from the permafrost thawing. I mean, you might be familiar with some of these images. So like in Alaska, a lot of the highways are buckling. There was this bridge that they built in China that collapsed pretty quickly, actually, after they built it. They weren't really planning for the thawing of the, of the ground. A lot of buildings that have been coming down because of the uh, permafrost thaw. Another thing that we're seeing in the Arctic is that there's a lot of methane being released from the lakes. So a lot of these um, lakes that are starting to thaw, they're starting to release methane, and it bubbles up like this. It actually looks like the water is, is boiling, basically. Um, and here's an example of this a colleague of mine who's burning some of the thermokarst, I mean, some of the methane from a thermokarst lake um, in Siberia. And so, of course, one of the things they worry about is because methane is 20 times more efficient than CO2 in terms of absorbing thermal infrared energy is that by releasing this methane, we're putting more, um, more powerful heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. We also are starting to observe a lot more methane bubbling coming out of the ocean as well. And this is an image off the East Siberian Sea where they've been documenting these recent large plumes of um, methane bubbling up beneath the ocean surface. They've been seeing some of this as well in the Barents Sea and, and over by Norway as well. Um, and so right now scientists are busy trying to understand and, and actually monitor how much methane is actually coming out of the ocean right now that we haven't seen before. <clears throat> and another thing that we're noticing too, another change that we're seeing is that the Arctic's actually getting a lot greener. So we can look at changes in basically how much vegetation there is in the Arctic with satellite data. And so these areas in um, light green are showing significant positive increases in, in um, vegetation. The areas in red are actually showing decreases in vegetation. And you can imagine over here in Canada, part of this is actually due to the fact there's been a lot of beetle kill. And in Colorado, we have a lot of dead trees, but Canada has dead trees on a scale that we can't even imagine in Colorado from the beetles killing them. There's also been a lot of fires, too, in Canada over the least last several years, and so part of that is also contributing to these negative trends in vegetation. But all along the coastal regions in the Arctic, we've been seeing an increase in vegetation, and we're seeing the tree line move a little bit further north. So what I mostly study is actually the sea ice, and it's a lot of ways become what we call our poster child of climate change, because it is one aspect of the, of the Arctic that is changing probably the most dramatically. So I always like to start exactly about what sea ice is, because it, it gets confusing sometimes in the media. I find that they'll run a sea ice story, but they'll show a picture of an iceberg which aren't the same thing. So just to make the point that sea ice is the frozen surface of the ocean. So it originates in the ocean. It does not come from land. It doesn't include any glaciers or ice sheets um, or any ice shelves that are floating on the ocean. And it certainly isn't icebergs. And because of that, because it originates in the ocean, if the sea ice melts, it's not going to raise sea level. And that is something that's often confused, I think, is that people are always like, well, what is this going to do to sea level? It doesn't directly affect sea level, because it's basically like an ice cube in a glass of water, and if you melt the ice, it's not going to change the level of the water in the glass. And here's just an example of what sea ice can look like. Um, when it tends to form, at first when the ocean freezes over, it gets this greasy look to it. Um, we call that grease ice. And then after a while, those, those platelets of ice start to come together, and they form what we call pancake ice, which is still very, very thin ice, but it starts looking like pancakes. And then these will come together and they'll form ice flows. And then sometimes when these are moving together, they move around by the ocean and the currents, and then they'll ridge and they'll like become very, very large, you know, tens of meters high and down um, pretty far deep as well. And, and traveling over this ice can be really rough. And when I worked in Barrow, we tried to build highways through this ice to get out onto the ice to do some sampling. And it's, you take sledgehammers and ice axes and you go out there and hack yourself a road through this rubbled ice. It's not very much fun, but it's, it's kind of interesting. But just to be clear, 
while this is a beautiful iceberg, it's an amazing image that a colleague of mine, Sebastian Copeland, took on one of his um, expeditions through Antarctica, actually. Um, that is not sea ice. So whenever you see that in a, in a newspaper article, you could write the editors and say, you know, that's not sea ice. And sea ice, actually, in the Arctic has quite a big, large seasonal variability. And if we look at wintertime, so we're about usually in March, in Fort Torrance, you saw this is Siberia and Alaska and Greenland. And the sea ice forms, you know, this is the Arctic Ocean, which is typically covered with sea ice year round, but it extends pretty far south. It goes all the way down here to St. Lawrence and Nova Scotia area. It's here in the Bering. It goes in the Sea of Akash, which is near Japan. So it has quite a large range in the wintertime, and it's about 15 million square kilometers of the ocean surface is covered by ice during the winter at its maximum. But then in summer, the ice melts. All along the periphery, Hudson Bay is, is ice-free. This is Baffin Bay um, on the west coast of Greenland. This is the East Greenland Sea. That has a lot less ice. I mean, so basically, the ice is pretty much confined just to the Arctic Ocean. And on average, it's about 7 million square kilometers of the Arctic Ocean has ice um, at the end of the summer melt season. And you can see that. I mean, so these are the, this, this would be called the Northern Sea Route through the Russian side, and this is the Northwest Passage through um, the Canadian Archipelago. So these are some of the shipping routes that people are looking at right now as this summer ice cover changes. Because what we're seeing is that in the Arctic, every month right now is experiencing a negative trend in the sea ice cover, how much ice is there. But the largest trends are happening in summer. This is the part that's changing the largest right now in the Arctic. And this is just actually a current image of what it looks like today. So this is um, from May 16th. This is a MODIS image. So it's a visible image from satellite. And so here's Greenland. And this is where all the sea ice is right now. You can kind of see some coming down through the East Greenland Sea. Part of um, Baffin Bay is already starting to break up. There's some open water here, a big polynya here. Um, there's open water here along the west coast, but there's still ice in here. Um, Novaya Zemlya is over in this region, and there's still some ice in here. Um, Svalbard, I don't know if I can see it. So that's right here. So that's actually starting to become ice-free. OK. <laughs> so this is an animation just over time from a satellite data record of what's been happening to the summer ice cover. And this is an animation of just basically the, light, the ice that's left over at the end of the summer melt season. And you can see there's a lot of variability. It varies quite a bit from year to year. You have ups and downs um, along the curve. But in the last few years, as we keep going along here, take a second, we're seeing like in the last several years that there's been a big change in the amount of ice, of the old ice that's in the Arctic Ocean. And so this is, this is actually, I, I have to, say that this is not the total ice, this is actually the oldest ice, so the ice that's been around for several melt seasons. So um, that'll be a little bit different than the next slide I'm going to show, or in two after. But So yeah, this is kind of what's been happening now. And in 2007, there was sort of a new record low in terms of how much ice was left in the Arctic Basin at the end of the summer melt season. This is a bit of a longer time series. It starts in 1953, because it's looking at earlier satellite data and ship observations and aircraft observations. So we can kind of go back until about 1953 with somewhat of an accuracy as to what's been happening in the ice cover. And if we look at the red line here, and the orange line is sort of where we normally expect to see the ice to be at the end of summer, this is where the ice ended up in 2007. And it was about a 26% drop from the previous year in terms of the overall extent of the Arctic Ocean covered by ice. And it raised a lot of eyebrows. People were. I mean, scientists, we were all a little bit surprised that this happened. We didn't expect to see such a large ice drop. I mean, we know it's been going down, but we didn't expect it to go down that much. And there was a lot of media attention. A lot of people were saying, well, are we on the threshold of a tipping point? Are we going to lose all the ice um, in the Arctic? And that would made a, there's a lot of, a lot of people wondering what's going to happen next. But I think it's interesting to look at, well, what happened? What caused, what happened in 2007 that caused the Arctic to lose so much ice in a single melt season? And a big part of it was that you had just had unusual weather patterns that brought in warm temperatures and also had really strong winds that pushed the ice away from the coast. And so what that weather pattern was, um, here I'm looking at sea level pressure. And so, sorry, we're upside down. This is Greenland over here, and here's Siberia, and here's Alaska. What we had is a really big high pressure over the central Arctic Ocean that was very anomalous. And it was coupled with very strong low pressure 
over Siberia. And what that does is it brings in winds from the south, so you're bringing in warm, warm winds from the south that can, one, help melt the ice, but also push the ice away from the coast. So when you look at back at this figure here, you can see that where you really lost the ice was off the coast of Siberia here, where you had that big, strong um, wind gradient that was pushing the ice away. The other thing that happens when you have a big high pressure system like that, you also have very clear skies. So we didn't have many clouds that summer. So a lot of the sun's energy could hit the ice and help melt the ice. And so what we saw, if we look at the temperature anomalies, and again, here's Greenland, so we're upside down here, but we're not here. But here's the big temperature anomaly. So big warmth, like four degrees Celsius um, warmer than normal for June and July. And the ice was just being pushed completely out of the Arctic towards the North Pole. So that's a big part of what happened in 2007. But while that was unusual, to a certain extent, it's not that we haven't seen that sort of a weather pattern set up before in the summertime. It's not completely unusual. So what we're realizing that a big part of it is, is that the ice cover has gotten very thin. And by being thin, it means that it can melt out easier in the summer. And also is more, um, it can actually move around a lot more so it can push more ice out of the way if you have strong winds. And so we don't have great estimates of ice thickness because it's been really tough until the recent years when we've had more satellite data before people would go with submarines and collect ice thickness data with sonars or they'd go out in the ice and they'd drill down to the ice to figure out how thick it is. So, but we have a bunch of submarine data from the 50s and 70s. Um, not sure why this isn't working now. Which is basically the dark blue. And then you have some submarine data from the 90s. And then we have the satellite data, which is in the light blue from ISAT in this last decade. And so you can just look at different regions around the Arctic Ocean where you had areas that were, you know, three to four meters thick of ice. And now it's less than two meters thick. So if you have ice that's only two meters thick and you're melting about one and a half, two meters in the summertime, you're going to start losing a lot more ice. And this is a big culprit behind what we've been seeing lately. And while the ice did recover a little bit after 2007, it's not recovering that much. I mean, 2011 was almost as low as 2007. And so this decline right now is about 13% per decade, and it's really not bouncing back. And we do have to point, you know, notice though that you do have a lot of variability along this curve. And that really points to the importance of summer circulation. So weather patterns that set up every year are very important as to what's going to happen from year to year. But this overall downward trend, we really think, is, is largely linked to the fact that the ice has just gotten a lot thinner because temperatures have warmed in the Arctic. So the ice doesn't grow as thick in the winter. It melts earlier in the summer. And so you just have all these positive feedbacks kicking in that are taking away more and more of this ice every year. And of course, what's been happening because of that, with the ice melting, is you have all these shipping routes starting to open up. So the Northwest Passage was open in 2007. It's been open every summer since then. And it's also been open on the Northern Sea Route side um, since 2008. It's been open every year as well. And last summer, the Northern Sea Route opened up very, very early. And Russia sent its first tanker through in June, end of June. And they sent eight, ta eight tankers through the Northern Sea Route delivering oil from Russia to China. And this is two summers ago, you had a sailboat from Russia and a sailboat from Norway that sailed the whole um, Arctic. So they went through the Northern Sea Route and they went through the uh, Northwest Passage. And they're sort of racing each other for the summer. I think the, the Russians actually won that one. But you had two sailboats circumnavigating the Arctic. So this is sort of a kind of in a snapshot of what's going on right now in terms of marine activity in the Arctic. Because as you imagine, as you start losing more and more ice, it's going to open up a lot of more opportunities for marine traffic in the Arctic. And so this, the blue here is just locations where there's a lot of ship activity due to hard minerals extraction. The green shows you areas of marine tourism, which has really increased a lot in Greenland over the last several years. There's a lot more cruise ships coming to Greenland. Iceland has a lot of cruise ships. Svalbard is getting a lot busier. There's been a few icebreakers that go to the North Pole um, that are taking tourists up there as well. You have the major fisheries are in the Arctic are the Bering Sea and the Barents Sea off the coast of Norway. That probably comprises probably at least half of the shipping that happens in the Arctic is related to fishing, actually. Um, and then you have a lot of oil and gas activity. So you've got the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea, um, southern Beaufort here. You've got the Barents Sea and all over here in the Kara Sea as well. There's a lot of shipping activity related to current 
um, oil and gas exploration, which is going to increase. I know Shell Oil right now has a contract to drill um, a bunch of exploratory holes this summer in the Beaufort Sea. Um, there's also summer sea lift activities that happen. And then there's also a lot of scientists up there that, that spend time. The U.S. right now, we only have one icebreaker. So we only are, are doing one ship up there with um, taking scientists up there. But there's a lot of other um, ships coming from Norway and Russia that have more icebreakers that are doing also a lot of science as well. And in 2004, there are about 5,500 ships that they calculated in the Arctic during the summertime. And it's kind of hard to get updates on this number because there's no really coherent way that people are reporting their ship activity. But we know that this number has been increasing, and it's going to increase more and more. And of course, one of the things that we do know is the Arctic contains a lot of oil and natural gas. The estimate in 2008 from the USGS was that there's 90 billion barrels of oil um, in the Arctic and 1,700 cubic trillion feet of natural gas and 44 billion barrels of natural liquid gas. And 84% of this that's up there is actually occurring offshore. It's in the Arctic Ocean. So as these, um, these regions become more and more ice-free, there's a lot of activity. And this is, this is over here on the US side in the Beaufort Sea, where um, there's going to be some exploratory drilling happening this summer with Shell. They won't actually be able to drill until 2022 is when they can actually start drilling. Um, I was actually meeting with a, a guy from the, um, the Navy a couple days ago trying to figure out really trying to figure out what, what kind of data collection do we have in this area, how can we get ready, you know, what do we know about the ice conditions, because they need to be there to support um, in case things happen. So they're, they're trying to gear up and better understand how they can support the, uh, the industry that's going up there. <coughs> I don't know, Obama gave the, the rights to start the exploratory drilling this summer, but in terms of when they can actually drill, that's another 10 years down the road. And as you can imagine, as, as the Arctic sea ice changes, it's going to have also a lot of impact on the species that depend on the ice for their survival. And there's been stories, of course, about how it's going to impact the polar bears. Um, they certainly depend on the ice basically to hunt their favorite food, which is the seals. So if the ice disappears earlier or if they, um, if they get out and it breaks up and they get trapped out there, then they're kind of stuck. Either they have to swim long distances or they get trapped on land without able to eat. The seals also spend a lot of their life um, attached directly to the sea ice. They give birth to their pups under the snow mounds on the sea ice. So, for example, if the ice were to break up earlier, it starts melting earlier, a lot of those pups get dumped into the ocean before they're fully weaned. And a lot of other animals, the ivory gull, um, it's also intimately tied to the timing of the ice when, it's, when it lays its eggs. Um, the muskox isn't really necessarily tied to the ice, but what's interesting is the climate changes happening in the Arctic are also affecting them a little bit in that just changes in how precipitation falls. If it falls as snow or as it falls as rain, it makes it harder for them to get to their food. If it falls as rain and freezes over, they can't actually get to the tundra to eat, but they can get through the snow to get to their food. <coughs> and so because the polar bears are uniquely tied to the sea ice, it's one of the reasons why they've been listed as endangered right now um, by the U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service. And part of it is, that is, is because every week that the bear is not hunting, it loses about 22 pounds. And so what happens is that the bears become so thin that they can't actually reproduce, and it starts to impact on their um, fat stores and their ability to reproduce. And they're completely dependent on this, this sea ice. So it's, it starts from the basics of when you get the upwelling nutrients that feed the plankton, that feed the shrimp, that feed the other small organisms, that feed the fish, which feed the seals, which feed the bears. So this whole cycle of how everything is tied to the ice really is directly impacting the bears. And it's, it's hard to imagine that the polar bears, if, if the sea ice were to go away completely, it's hard to imagine that they would be able to survive because they, they really need access to the seals. And I mean, unless the seals get trapped on land with the bears, which I suppose could happen, then maybe they, they could keep eating. The seals are definitely feeling the impacts, um, at least in Canada, because the Gulf of St. Lawrence hasn't had ice the last three winters. If, well, this winter there was a little bit more ice, but to the two winters before that there was no, no sea ice at all in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And so the Canada Fisheries, um, they noticed in the spring of 2010 that there were only 600 goal, seals in the Gulf when normally there are about 30,000. And so they actually stopped the hunting um, for the last couple winters and didn't allow hunters to go out there and hunt seals because there, there really were no seals out there at all this, the last few winters. And of course we need to remember that um, 
the, there's a lot of people that live in the Arctic. It's different from like the Antarctic in that there's no, in the Arctic there's a bunch of indigenous communities that depend strongly on the sea ice for travel and hunting, to get to the whales, to get to the seals that they eat. And it's also their main livelihood and basis for their cultural identity. And so a lot of the changes that are happening for the, um, in the Arctic are impacting these local communities. And they've been pointing, the elders of these communities have been pointing to this period of what they call a considerable change, you know, and they can't predict weather as well and ice conditions as well. In the past, they would use um, traditional indicators such as clouds and winds and currents um, to let them know when they could go out and hunt and when the ice is safe. And a lot of these aren't working anymore. And as ice forms later and breaks up earlier in the year, travel has become more difficult. Hunters are getting trapped out there on the ice. So they're, they're seeing some pretty big impacts as well. And certainly it, it affects their food resources because there's still a lot of subsistence hunting going on in the Arctic by these communities. I mean, there's just some modernization that's happened, but there's also a lot of subsistence hunting. And so the reductions in the sea ice are shrinking their marine-based habitat for the ice-dependent seals and the walrus and the polar bears and seabirds. And even just the migratory patterns of some of the whales and all of that is changing as well, or where the fish are compared to where they used to be. So it certainly affects their food supply. And a lot of these local communities are very, very concerned about the changes that are happening. I know there was one group that tried to sue the U.S. government several years ago for climate change, saying that you know it's destroying their way of life, which I, I don't know if I think that that's exactly the right way to go about it, but I mean, there's certainly, some of the communities are very excited about climate change because of the potential economic boom that it brings them with the oil companies coming in and with the mining coming in, but some of these other communities are completely against it because they want to keep their traditional ways of life, which are definitely starting to change. These communities are also facing incredible coastal erosion. And some of these communities, like Shishmaref, the whole community needs to be moved inland because the whole town is falling into the sea. Because one of the things that happens is that you have permafrost that's thawing, so the ground is becoming more unstable. And then at the same time, you're exposing these coastal regions to larger waves from storms because you don't have the ice anymore now to act as a buffer. And so now you have a large fetch where the waves can get very, very big and they can come in and just eat away large parts of the coastline. And there's parts of Alaska right now that are experiencing 45 feet per year of erosion along the coastline. Big, big changes, I mean, just, just big chunks breaking off consistently over and over again. Um, so that's also affecting a lot of the communities as well. So what about the rest of us? I mean, what, why, did, why would we care here in Oregon about what's happening up in the Arctic? It's pretty far away from us. We might think polar bears are cute and we don't want them to go away, but skin is pretty detached from our, our lives here, and so why should we really care? Well, one of the ways that what happens in the Arctic affects all of us is through the fact that the Arctic acts as our refrigerator. It helps keep the planet cool. And it does this because it reflects most of the sun's energy back out to space because it's covered by snow and ice most of the year. But if you take away that snow and ice, the land can absorb the sun's energy, the ocean can absorb the sun's energy, and the Arctic heats up. And when the Arctic heats up, that's going to affect all of our weather patterns because what drives our atmospheric circulation and our ocean circulation is the fact that the equator is warmer than the poles. So the point of your atmospheric circulation and your ocean currents is to help transport that excess heat from the equator to the poles. So if you change that temperature gradient, it's going to affect your weather patterns because it's going to change the way the atmosphere transports heat. It's going to change the way the ocean transports heat. And that's how What's happening in the Arctic is definitely relevant to what's happening in our lives because it's going to impact our weather. And so when we look at this in terms of this, we call it the ice albedo feedback, which is an amplifier of climate change. So you know, if you have snow on top of the sea ice, it's going to reflect about 85% of the sun's energy back out to space. The ocean only reflects about 7%, so it actually absorbs about 93% of that energy. So that warms up the oceans and melts away more ice. And that's why we call it a positive feedback effect. And that's why scientists have known for some time that if the planet was going to warm, we start seeing the signs in the Arctic first, because it's very sensitive to that balance of how much snow and ice there is. And so again, when we look at temperature trends, and this is just from a shorter, just satellite-only data record, we find that you know, the Arctic is warming. It's, it's pretty much red everywhere. Um, it's not, there are certainly areas where it's been cooling, but the ocean areas, are warming and the land areas are warming. And just to look at kind of just some local impacts of that, 
Um, this is just looking at air temperature anomalies in autumn. So basically, once you've, you're finished with the melt season and the ocean wants to start freezing back up, it ha the ocean will have to release all that heat back to the atmosphere before it can freeze again. And so what we're seeing in the, in the fall before, um, as the ocean starts to freeze back over, is these strong temperature, positive temperature anomalies over the Arctic Ocean area that then can get passed around to the land as well because circulation can spread that warmth over to other areas. We also noticed that because you have these areas where you've had more open water in recent years, you get these strong transfers of energy, of heat and, and moisture. And so we're looking at it in terms of sensible heat flux and a latent heat flux. So what it also does is it puts more energy in the Arctic atmosphere that can be used to help intensify storms, maybe help more, make more frequent storms. And one of the things we've noticed lately in the last um, several years when we've been losing a lot of the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean is that we've been having a lot more snow cover actually over Siberia. It's sort of a, um, a different effect. So you have this open water and you're releasing all this moisture and heat into the atmosphere and it's now falling as snow over Siberia. So you're actually seeing a little bit of a negative feedback in that you're getting more snow cover um, over Siberia in the autumn season. Uh, what a colleague of mine was just recently looking at too, which becomes relevant to us, is that if we have this autumn warming, um, we can also see that in terms of the thickness of the atmosphere. So this is actually looking at thickness um, anomalies, the vertical thickness of the atmosphere for fall, spring, um, I mean, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And so what you see is that because you have all this warming in the autumn, you also have very large changes in the vertical thickness gradient of the, of the atmosphere, which is strongest, of course, in the, the autumn right after you have all this heat release from the ocean. It also kind of extends into the winter time. But why this matters is it reduces in the thickness gradient between the poles and the equator, and that governs all of your winds. And so it changes the way the winds are, are moving around in the, in the atmosphere. And so one thing that they recently showed was that because you've been changing the zonal thickness gradient, between the equator and the poles, which is shown by this plot. So this is for the fall, and this is for the winter. And you can see that it's been declining, the thickness gradient, the difference between the pole and the equator. But then that's also slowing down all these zonal wind speeds are also changing in the winter and the fall. And so as the thickness gradient has decreased with the warming that we're seeing in the Arctic, it also is weakening the upper level zonal winds. And what this means is that if you slow down the zonal wind speed, you slow down these large-scale Rossby waves that, and also have higher wave amplitudes of those waves. And so what they've been saying is that you can end up with more persistent weather conditions, such as drought or storms, because these waves are moving slower, they have a higher amplitude, and it creates these blocking events in the, in the atmosphere that then allows um, some of these extreme weather conditions to persist. And this was a paper that was just published um, about a month ago. But, so they're looking at how the heat waves might become more persistent over time in droughts, purely because we're changing the zonal wind speed in the, in the atmosphere by warming up the Arctic. And, you know, as you imagine, too, the, the warmer atmosphere can hold a lot more water vapor, so we know that there's a potential for more frequent and intense storms. We're seeing this already in the Arctic happening. But here's a video of what happened in 2010, the big snowstorm that happened over the East Coast in 2010. And part of it was the fact that you had an El Nino, so you're on the Pacific side here, and you had a lot of uplift of moisture that traveled over the US. But what was also happening in the Arctic at the time is you had very, very high pressure, very anomalous high pressure in the Arctic that caused these cold outbreaks to come down from the Arctic. And that combined with the moist air coming up from the Pacific created this really huge snowstorm in the East Coast in winter 2010 that I think broke a lot of records. And what is interesting is so the, the circulation pattern that happened in the Arctic that helped this help make this storm such a big snowfall storm is one of the things that some of our climate models say, well, if, if you keep taking away the ice, you might start to see this more persistent, positive sea level pressure anomalies over the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime, which then could lead to these cold outbreaks, which could then have more potential for these intense storms. So just to kind of get an idea of what we think is going to keep happening in the Arctic, one of the ways that we, we get at that is by looking at climate models, because we don't have another planet really to do an experiment on. And, and anything that's happening today in the climate system, you have natural climate variability, and then you have the external forcing from human activities. And they're both acting on the system at the same time. So it's really hard to separate out, well, OK, we're warming. How much of that warming is due to human activities? How much of it that is due to natural climate variability? 
Now that's a really hard question to answer with observational data alone because it's hard to separate that out. So what we do is we run climate models where you can specify different emission scenarios, what happens if we just keep putting more and more CO2 in the atmosphere as population increases, as more people have cars and, and heat, how is that going to impact what's happening in the Arctic, for example? And so one of the things that I look at is how is it going to impact the sea ice cover? And so um, this is a comparison of two different basically modeling experiments. So the black line is the observations, what's been happening in the ice cover right now in September. The red is from all the climate models that were used in the last IPCC report, the 2007 report, with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. And what we found in that study, when we, when we first looked at the data, was that, well, the, the models are at least in general agreement with the observations that the ice has been declining over the last 50-some years. But they show too much ice. And the rate of how quickly the ice has been going down, it was not well captured by these models. And so when we looked at some of these model projections and they, you know, when they might go ice free, which so, there were some extreme models in this, in this red um, selection of models that would show ice free by about 2050. Most of them were like around 2080 or further. But so when we looked at that, we saw, well, the ice is going away a lot quicker. So, you know, maybe it'll happen even faster than these models are saying. Well, now there's a new round of climate models that have just come out that are going to be in the next IPCC report. And what we find is that they're actually better matching what the observations have been showing us at least over the last 50 some years. Certainly in the last few years, we're, we're kind of on the extreme end of what some of these models are showing. But they're showing ice-free conditions could happen, you know, maybe around here like 2050 on the extreme end. This is just plus or minus one standard deviation, the shaded line. Um, again, the mean of all the models is, is sometime after 2100. But it's interesting in that the models are in qualitative agreement, at least with the observations that the ice has been going down. And you only get that when you run these models with the observed record of greenhouse gases. If you, t if you keep the greenhouse rec gases um, constant at pre-industrial levels, none of the models are going to simulate any decline in the ice cover. So at least in the models, the decline is definitely related to increases in CO2, which are causing the temperature increases. And certainly, one thing we know for sure, because everybody's working on this right now, is by the shrinking of ice, and this is just some different projections of where the ice might be, um, like in, by the end of the century, is that all of these shipping routes are opening up, and there's going to be a lot more marine activity and a lot more exploration happening in the Arctic to uncover the, the resources, the oil and the gas, and the minerals up there. So it's going to put a lot of stress on the, on the ecology of the Arctic, for sure. The other one thing that I want to just, the last slide before I go to my conclusions, is that one thing we've been able to notice, too, is that when the ice disappears quickly in the Arctic, that positive feedback, because you now have all the warm temperatures from the ocean that are going back into the atmosphere, when you have these periods of rapid ice loss and you look at future projections of temperature over the land areas, they're showing temperature changes that are like three degrees Celsius or more, whereas if you just had the ice was just staying there and you had just had global warming, so just the background warming, then the temperature changes would only be about one degree Celsius, so a lot less. And why that matters? is that the permafrost contains about 1,700 gigatons of carbon right now. And for comparison, the Earth the atmosphere only contains about 730 gigatons of carbon. So this is a big feedback that hasn't been well accounted for in the, the models. I mean, some of the climate models are now trying to take into carbon, um, the carbon cycle and what's going to happen with the carbon cycle. Because certainly, if the permafrost thaws more and releases more methane, any of these warming projections that we're thinking about in our models is going to be amplified but the fact that all of this land here, which is permanently frozen, is no longer going to be permanently frozen. So just to conclude, um, we know that many components of the Arctic environment are undergoing very large changes. We see it in every aspect of the Arctic environment, whether it's the land, whether it's the ocean, whether it's the ice sheets or the glaciers. So we're seeing these big changes happening. And a lot of these changes that we're seeing, I mean, actually all of them are really consistent with what climate models have been saying are going to happen as we keep increasing greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. We do find that, at least in the latest models, that sea ice loss is no longer outpacing these models. So perhaps an ice-free by 2050 in the summer times might be more realistic. Um, and we do know that the changes that are happening in the Arctic are already affecting the environmental systems, the biological, and the societal systems. And these impacts are going to grow um, as, as changes keep increasing in the Arctic. And they, um, warm even more. And we do know that, of, of course, continued changes that are happening in the Arctic are going to not just be impacting in the Arctic, but they're also going to start to impact us. A lot of that, I would say, is still pretty uncertain because um, in terms of 
climate model projections about what's going to happen to precipitation. Where's the rain going to fall? Where's the snow going to fall? They're not very robust yet with, with those signals. I mean, they're very robust with saying that the temperatures are going to increase, that the ice is going to go down, but they're not really robust on what's going to happen to our weather systems. And part of that is just the difficulties in understanding how to model cloud processes, what's going to happen with clouds. And if you start having these snow feedbacks, so more snow over Siberia, that actually might help offset the warming. So there's a lot of unknowns still that the scientists are trying to better understand. And just if you want to know more about um, research that happens at the University of Colorado that's related to climate change, you can also go to our series website. Um, and they have this um, learn about more about climate.colorado.edu, where you can also learn more as well. OK, thank you. So since we got to the uh, final slide, uh, I would like to thank Alan Shanks for providing Plan C, the computer, uh, tonight. And also to Julianne for three days to make it out here to do an hour talk. We've got time for a few questions. I've heard a little bit about some areas like Australia, even their right wing, because they had 10 years of drought, are, are more open to the consequences of climate change. And um, I wonder if you can speak at all about, you know, big geopolitical areas, whether they're more open than, than our right wing, which seems to think it's a plot of Al Gore's. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, in general, because I, I do, I do um, have a lot of European colleagues, you know, it's interesting because in Europe it seems like they, they understand it a lot more and their government seem to be more um, receptive to the idea that they need to do things and there's a lot of countries that are actually trying to make some differences and reduce their carbon footprint whereas in the U.S. it's it's not happening very quickly and you know the big part of the problem that I think is just that there's too much money in oil and gas and nothing's going to change I mean there's so like the fact that we're going to be starting to drill in the Arctic Ocean I mean it's, it's kind of ironic to me in that well, if, if greenhouse gases are the reason why the ice is going away, and then we're just going to use that as a reason to get more of the oil and gas that's going to increase greenhouse gases, it's just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's, there's so much money in it. And so even going to the Arctic and having to deal with the fact that you're drilling in ice-infested waters, and even though the ice is going away, there's still going to be some ice floating around, and there's still going to be icebergs and hazards that you have to deal with, and yet it's profitable. And that, that to me, is shocking that it's more profitable to do that than to actually try to do more. What is the, uh, the effect, basically, of, let's say, the uh, Arctic ice and any melting on Greenland that's going to affect the uh, Gulf Stream? Because that's one thing that's going to definitely can possibly shut down. Well, and that was, yeah, that was one of the things that um, people had been concerned about, and that there has been some slowing down of the thermal haline circulation. But in terms of the sea ice, it's interesting. So if, if you have less sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, you're also exporting less out of Fram Strait, which is where it would melt in the North Atlantic. And so in terms of how much more fresh water the sea ice was, was contributing to maybe slowing down the thermal haline, it probably may not be the sea ice that's going to be an important factor. But you hit a good point in that even though the sea ice doesn't necessarily affect sea level or anything else, what it does do is it warms up the atmosphere, which can affect Greenland melt. And if Greenland starts dumping a lot more fresh water into the Arctic Ocean and the North Atlantic, then I, then I can imagine it would start to really slow down some of that circulation. Sorry. Okay. Back to the man's comments about Australia. My mother was born in Southern Cross, Australia, about 1917, and at that time it was considered the hottest place on earth. She wrote stories about not seeing rain until she was five years old. In my lifetime, it has gone from being a hot, deserty place where people lived underground to being having a climate mm -hmm. much like the Willamette Valley. And I think this has been kind of viewed as being a good thing and then ignored. And I'm wondering how many other countries, if there really is the communication, and how many experiences like this have there been in the past 50 years? And, you know, if things change as they get worse for some people, if they'll get better for others and make it harder uh, to make people realize what's happening. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I know like parts of, like Russia tends to be in favor of it because for them, not only does it allow them to increase their growing season because temperatures are warmer, so they can grow more wheat, for example, 
I mean, for them, their, their resources that they have in Russia in terms of oil and gas, I mean, they have a lot there. So they're actually, they think it's actually a good thing for, for Russia. You know, I mean, in, in terms of like what's happening regionally, like with Australia, I mean, of course, global warming is kind of a misnomer because it doesn't mean every place on the planet is going to warm. There might be regional cooling. So that's part of the problem with like, calling it global warming. But I mean, as a whole of the planet, we are warming. Um, but certainly, there's also these complications that you can have these natural the climate variability patterns that maybe are decades, you know, at least a decade long, or maybe two decades. And I kind of look at climate change as that you you have two things acting on your system. You have natural climate variability, and you have the force changes, and they can oppose each other. So you can have natural climate variability that might bring back the ice for like 10 years. That could happen. But then if it's in phase again with the force component, you're going to get more dramatic ice losses. So really, as scientists, what you're looking at is these long-term trends. You're not concerned too much about the ups and downs along that curve. And so like the 2007 minimum in the ice cover, well, it got a lot of media attention. It probably shouldn't have because in some ways, I mean, it's just a natural variability event that happened. I mean, it certainly was dramatic, but just as dramatic could be when it comes all the way back up by another you know, 26%. And then people will be like, well, there's no nothing to worry about. So there's, there's two things happening. So you've got weather and you've got climate change. And, and, and they, can, they can oppose each other for a while, and you might get periods where it's really nice. From at least uh, 1492 on, it's been a dream of mariners to um, be able to sail west from Europe and hit Asia without having to go around South America mm -hmm. or something like that. Yep. Um, I think it, on this northern, and looking for a northwest passage is always exploration of the, the coast along here. Um, I think Japan is something like five times closer to a northwest passage to get to England than to go through the Panama Canal or, mm -hmm. or ship things across the United States from Asia and then take them yeah. across the Atlantic. When do you, do you have any kind of rough estimates or something when uh, I guess you'd say ordinary cargo ships could fall containers, for instance, from like Japan to, to England. Uh, you know, icebreakers are very expensive mm -hmm. ships to haul cargo. Yeah, and you know, so, I mean, typically scientists thought the Northern Sea would be the first one that would be more viable in terms of the shipping route. Um, we expected that one to be probably more open, partly because the Cayman Archipelago is this narrow series of channels and, and Sort of where the, where the last oldest and thickest ice is right now originating or staying is actually north of the Canadian Archipelago and, and Greenland. So that's where we've kind of thought you would still have some ice left. But the last five years, summers, it's been open in that region too, which I don't think was, was quite anticipated. So Russia's been, I mean, of course, they've had a lot of icebreakers. They've been using a lot of these routes for quite some time. But now they're able to do some of this without having icebreakers and, sh and ice reinforced ships. And I would say that. I mean, I, I really would think that that route is going to become the one that's, that's going to be most widely used for quite some time, which would have benefited, of course, Jap Japan, for example. Um, yeah, the, the, the Northwest Passage, I think it's interesting that it keeps being open, but it was definitely not the one that people thought would be. Um, and there's a lot of old ice circulating in that region, so I think there's more hazards in that region to deal with in general. Is uh, anybody looking at isostatic rebound on Greenland to the ice load? Yeah, they are. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing that work myself, but people are looking at that. And, and what's that? Yeah, so the GRACE instrument can do that because it's measuring the gravity. Um, so, well, of course, if that requires it, you need to have a really good idea of what the bedrock is and, and what the elevation of the bedrock is. And I'm not directly involved in that research, but I know a lot of people that, that are trying to, you know, better map what's underneath the ice so they can understand the, the isostatic region. Again, it's the last talk in the lecture series this year. I'd like to thank the guys up in the booth, Dallas, Dean, and Floyd. Uh, I'd like to thank Julianne for being our final speaker and uh, running through the San Francisco airport <laughs> so that you could be here uh, to talk to us tonight, although you probably would have gotten it somewhere into Oregon yes, or today. And also to Oregon Resources for Financial and the college for this wonderful hall. And also definitely to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this evening, especially on an incredibly beautiful afternoon. So if you didn't sign in, if you wouldn't mind doing that on your way out, and look for the first talk in the fall. Have a great year.